She sits alone waiting for suggestions. He's so nervous, avoiding all the questions. Her lips are dry, her heart is gently pounding. Don't you just know exactly what they're thinking? His heart is beating like a drum, like a drum. Is he going to get this girl home? Well, soon, baby, we'll be all alone. Don't you know exactly what they're thinking? If you want my body and you think I'm sexy, come on, sugar, tell me so. If you really need me, just reach out and touch me. Come on, honey, tell me so. It went from 7,000 to 10,000 to 20,000. This community had seen enough, put up with enough and lived in fear for far too long. And his death will not pass without a riot. He's acting shy, looking for an answer. Come on, honey, let's spend the night together. Now hold on a minute before we go much further. Give me a dime so I can call my mother. They catch a cab to his high-rise apartment. At last he can tell exactly what his heart meant. His appeal was that he was the everyman. He was the guy next door. Until you saw the tapes. That, that changed everything. Was he some kind of predator? Was his death a revenge killing? If you want my body and you think I'm sexy, come on sugar, tell me so. The year was 1978 and it was madness. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. The of the founder of the People's Temple, Jim Jones. Well, Terry, I reported over His a week ago that Monday was sleep. a suspect in the disappearance. Some had pillows beneath their heads. Oh. Some died alone, separated by our families until the end. Air Force aircraft in the vicinity. Wait. No, no, Babies were fed the lethal potion that sort of believed each day about five He's minutes after over swallowing me. a mixture of cyanide. Well, the Sierra Juliet, that's not an aircraft. It's... Can you describe the... Uh... I'll plead not guilty right now. Hey, well, Terry, I reported over a week ago that Bunday was a suspect in the disappearance of an eight-year-old... The aircraft has just passed over me at at least a thousand feet above. Is there any Air Force aircraft in the vicinity? No, no, an aircraft. He's going to be playing some sort of game. He's flying over me. Call the Sierra Juliet. It's not an aircraft. It's... He'll be found in the right temple, now. Jim Jones. His son, who were simply going right to now. sleep. Some had pillows beneath their heads. Some died alone, separated by all families until the end. Quit it. Babies were fed the lethal potion with a... It's believed each lived about five minutes after swallowing a mixture of cyanide. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. So we've reached the end of 1978. This is the last episode in the series. A lot of stories told. <laughs> so... Just just for those of you who like it, and this won't be everyone, and I understand that, and that is fine, at the very, very, very end, and I mean the very, very end, there's a little something musical, a little something extra for those who might like it. I'm calling it Barioke. It's the hits of 1978, and you and I can sing along together. And if that's not your thing... If you are a hater of my singing voice, babe, don't even worry about it. Turn it off. Just skip it. Like, it's way after the main episode. So, you know, let let that play. 
and then just turn the episode off. Don't be moaning about it on iTunes reviews, because that's just a waste of time for everyone. But if you do want it, bariochi at the very, very end of the episode. Okay, angel eyes, are you ready? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Way back in the mid-1960s, there was an American TV show called Hogan's Heroes. Now, I must admit, I'm not aware of this show, but from what I can gather, it was a sitcom that was set in the Second World War, and it was about the antics of a group of prisoners of war. If you're from the UK, I'm thinking kind of Dad's Army vibes. That kind of thing. So it was a very popular show. The show was on TV until 1971. Anyway, the main star of the show, Hogan himself, was an actor called Bob Crane. Now, Bob Crane was an actor who'd done lots of different little bit parts in things. He'd become a sort of personality, you know, he would pop up on, like, sketch comedy shows, radio shows. He'd done all these kind of bits and pieces, and now he had the main role in this TV show. Growing up, Bob Crane had been really into drumming and music. He was in various jazz bands. One of these people, I suspect, who was good at a lot of things and was probably always going to be quite successful. It's, it's something within the arts. Anyway, turns out acting would be the thing that he would be known for. So in 1949, he marries his girlfriend from high school, Anne, and he would have been about 21 years old at the time when he gets married and they go on to have three children. Now, getting this TV role in Hogan's Heroes, this meant stardom for Bob Crane. He was on primetime TV with a huge hit TV show and it ran for years. So a lot of money and a lot of fame came his way. I'm pretty sure that is also going to happen for me. You know, money, fame, etc. It's on its way. I've sent it to the universe. Now I just need the universe to do its work. But if the universe could hurry up, that would be great because it's kind of taking forever and I'd quite like to be like Beyonce levels of successful now. <laughs> ah. Anyway, what's going on with Bob? Right, enough about me. Back to Bob, Big Bobby, Bobalicious. So, this TV show that has made him really famous... It ends in 1971, and why? Well, it's that well-known thing of a TV show that's become really popular, but as time goes on, that popularity dwindles. It went from being in the top 10 most-watched shows in America, and then it slipped. And it slipped down to the top 30. And then by about 1970, it was just completely out of the charts. It just wasn't really being watched anymore, so it comes to an end. Now, this is difficult for Bob. He had really been riding that wave. And when it ended, other TV parts, they they came his way. He was offered bits and pieces, but nothing that really excited him. And he, Bob Crane was very, very open about the fact that he was disappointed in terms of what was coming in, in the way of roles. None of it challenged him. None of it set his world on fire. So, in conversations with one of the networks, he would go on to do his own TV show called The Bob Crane TV Show, but it was cancelled after 12 episodes. Not very popular. So he starts doing these after dinner plays, which is like, yeah, so like theatres would do a thing where like you would come along for the evening and eat your dinner whilst you watched a, a play. Fine, great. 
So Bob Crane's still a star in some sense. So people will pay to, to come to these events and see him. So that's fine. That's what Bob is up to in 1978. Now during the time that he had been on the show, he'd obviously met lots of different people. So fellow actors, technicians, producers, directors, all of this malarkey. And one person that he'd been introduced to was a man called John Carpenter. And John was a regional sales manager for Sony. And he was a specialist in electronics. So TV equipment, audio equipment, video recorders, all of that jazz. John Carpenter was your man. He knew all of this. In actual fact, John Carpenter was so good at setting up home sound systems and video recording devices that he had been employed by Elvis to set up his equipment in Graceland. So John Carpenter and Bob Crane, they strike up a friendship because Bob Crane's got this kind of interest in like video equipment, audio equipment. He wants to know more about it. So him and, him and John Carpenter, they become sort of friends. And the two men, they start going out together quite a lot to bars. Bob's marriage by this point is over. It's, it's finished. This relationship with his high school sweetheart had faded and he's single. John Carpenter, he was, in fact, married. But when the two men went out together, they went out on the hunt for a very particular thing. And that thing was sex. Now, Bob Crane had obvious appeal. He was a star. He was a household name. And when they would go out to bars, People would approach him and be like, oh my god, it's you, it's Bob Crane, can I get an autograph? And he was pleasant, he was lovely, he would give these autographs, he would chat to people, and he would introduce John Carpenter as his manager. Slight red flag there, because he's not your manager. Why are you pretending? But okay, that's that's just the, that's the ruse that the two men uh, worked under. So when the two men would meet uh, a woman or maybe two females, they would ask them to come back to their house and they would film the sex act. So quite often this would be a single woman coming back with these two men. I mean, it, it, it varied. It wasn't always just one woman on her own. Sometimes it was two, sometimes it was more. But more often than not, it would be one woman coming back with these two men. Now here's where we get into a grey area. Did these people who came back know that they were being filmed? Well, it's debatable. It's argued that it was all consenting, it was all above board, and that every girl who came back was told by Bob Crane and John Carpenter that they would be filmed. This is contested by some of the females who will say, no, they never knew that they were being filmed. Hmm. Tricky. Very, very tricky. So obviously John Carpenter, right, is an expert in the video recording equipment side of it. So he makes these setups like they're just, they're no problem for him to set up cameras to, to film the sex. And it meant that, you know, him and Bob Crane could watch back these sexual encounters really easily. And the two men begin to build a catalogue of sex tapes. And this goes on for years. They continue this routine of going to bars, meeting someone, bringing them back, making a sex tape, and now there's quite a sizable collection of videos. Eventually, in about 1976, 1977, somewhere around there, Bob Crane decides he's a bit bored of this now. 
He wants to stop doing it. And John Carpenter isn't happy. You see, for Carpenter, he had been able to live out his best life. He was riding that Bob Crane fame wagon. And it looked like that was coming to an end. And he is not happy about it. Now, what transpires between the two men isn't as factually correct as we'd like. But what we know is it wasn't a pleasant separation of that friendship. It it wasn't. It's, it's bitter on the part of John Carpenter. He's angry. He's angry that this escapade is coming to an end. And Bob Crane's like, he just wants to focus on acting and, and move on from the the videotaping of sex. He just wants to kind of move beyond it. Witnesses at the time will say that John Carpenter would take Bob Crane out to expensive restaurants and try to persuade him to keep this sex tape business going, that they could really just keep this up for years and years and years. But Bob Crane, he's not feeling it anymore. So it's 1978, and it's June, and Bob Crane is living in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he's performing in one of these dinner theatre pieces, a play called Beginner's Luck, and it's at a local theatre in Scottsdale. Now this is good, this is like steady work, you know he gets to go out every night on stage, do some acting within a company that he loves, fine. And it's just a it's just a normal day in that process. What happens each day is that at one o'clock the actors, the director, the technicians, they gather for a meeting to discuss the previous night's performance and any changes that might need to be made, etc. And then after that they would start to warm up, get the hair and makeup done, and get ready for the evening performance. One o'clock comes. And Bob Crane doesn't appear at the meeting. Hmm. Odd. Odd, think the company, because he's never late. Anyway, they think, maybe he's just running late, we'll just wait. So 1.30 comes. He's still not there. And now the actors, they all live nearby, so... One of the female actors, she says, Look, it won't take me very long. I'll just go to his place and just check on him. When she gets to Bob Crane's house, she knocks on the door, but there's no answer. She tries the door. It opens. And inside she finds the most horrendous scene. Bob Crane beloved actor and personality is dead. The 50 year old actor has been brutally murdered in his bed. Blood covers the bedroom. The actress immediately raises the alarm and before too long police are swarming the scene. The area gets shut down and the investigation begins. Now here's why I'm interested in this story. It's because it's so 1978. It really shows what a crime scene investigation looked like. And it's such a marker of that year. And this crime and how it's investigated is still being talked about and you'll, you'll see that as the story kind of unfolds. So first thing to say to start with is that there is no homicide department in Scottsdale. It just doesn't exist at this time. There's plenty of police, there's plenty of specialists, but there's no specialist in murder scenes. So, I mean, immediately that's a bit of a blunder. Because what you've got is you've got lots of police and you've got investigators who aren't experienced and they are just walking around the scene. So the Scottsdale police, knowing that they need a, a proper, proper expert, 
called the services of a man. Of course it was a man, it was 1978. <laughs> I don't know how many females held <laughs> power, <laughs> powerful positions within the police at that time. Maybe they did, I don't know. Um, <laughs> they call on a man, oh dear Lord, help me God with this guy's name. Dr. Hines Kartenishnigig. No, I don't think that was it. <clears throat> Let's try again. Dr. Heinz Kartenisch. I don't know why I've developed this accent while I'm trying to say his name. Anyway, he goes by the nickname Dr. K. Thank God. Dr. K is a specialist in crime scenes. We think. Let's hear what Dr. K does and determine if we really think he's an expert. When he arrives, Dr. K asks for the update, and it's this. From what police can tell, Bob Crane has two blows to his skull and an electrical cord wrapped around his neck, and he's in bed. His body is in a pretty advanced state of rigor mortis. It's believed he might have been dead for about 14 hours. Now, these days when we see a crime scene investigation on TV or whenever, what we see is the medical examiner photographing the body, but they're not necessarily always close up. And that's because we've got the technology now to not have to be close up to the body. You know, the crime scene photographer can be the other side of the room and still get really small, really accurate photos. Well, that wasn't the case. So Dr. K, he gets right in there. He gets right in a boot it, as a, a glass region would say. <laughs> he is up close to that body. He's moving it. He's examining it. And then he asks for his kit bag. From the kit bag, he takes out a razor and some shaving foam. And he begins to shave Bob Crane's head near where the blows are. He shaves this massive six-inch area around Bob Crane's ear. As he's doing this, the main detective, who's completely out of his depth, is questioning it and saying, should should this be happening at the crime scene or should the body be moved first? Dr K is like, listen, I am not taking anyone's advice here. I'm Dr K, I know what I'm doing. Do you? I'm not so sure. So here he is, he's flipping the body over, he's looking under the bed, he's he's really disrupting the scene. He orders that a few photographs of the scene be taken, but that's it, just a few. Not what we would see now, the millions of shot from different angles, just a couple will do. Dr K, after a little while of looking, announces that Bob Crane has been killed by receiving two blows to the skull, but they both look like they could be from different objects. And that the cord around his neck wasn't really there to strangle him, it might just have been there to silence him as he was dying. Hmm, let's talk about that cord around his neck. It was an electrical cord from a piece of video recording equipment. Interesting. Here was a man who had quite the fruitful porn empire. Using this equipment all the time and here is a piece of it wrapped around his dead body. And what about those bashes on the head? What object could have done that? Or what two objects? Well, looking at it, Dr K says one could have come from something like a tripod. And that's just the kind of thing that Bob Crane and John Carpenter used often. However, can they see a tripod anywhere in the room? No, it's missing. So what testing is actually done at the scene. Well, there's a few blood samples taken here and there. But that's about it. And there is a massive oversight here. In that there is semen 
found on Bob Crane's body. And when the sort of inexperienced detectives say to Dr K, there appears to be semen on his body, should we collect it for a sample? Might it help us identify the killer? The doctor says, don't be ridiculous. What's semen going to tell us? (laughs) And I'm quoting here. He says, it's just going to tell us that he had a hot piece of ass before he died. (laughs) Okay then. (laughs) So the doctor's assuming Bob Crane had sex and then was murdered. So no sample of semen is taken. It just gets cleared away by police. By now there has been so much cross-contamination of the scene. Doctors all over the place, police all over the place. I mean, honestly, they may as well just have opened the door to his room and said, anyone want to see a dead body? In you come. And just let people walk through it. The whole thing is a palaver. So away from the crime scene, detectives have to start asking the obvious questions. Who were his enemies? Why would someone want to kill him? Was this random? Did someone plan this? They look at things like the fact that there was no sort of breaking and entry, so he must have known who he was letting into the room. Now all of this doesn't take long, and of course the man in the frame is John Carpenter who police will call the Porn Partner. (laughs) What a nickname. (laughs) This porn emporium that the two men have been building for years, it's uncovered by police. Now it's at this point, Bob Crane's son, Robert, who is in his 20s, he jumps into the story briefly, and he completely defends his dad's collection. You see... Robert, the son, he's been brought up with this. He, from teenage years, was exposed to and seeing all of the Polaroids that his dad and John Carpenter had taken. He's seen the videos that his dad's been making for years. So he's there and he's saying, look, let's not get this twisted My dad wasn't a pervert. He wasn't some sexual pest. Robert says this. My father loved women. I think he might have been overcompensating for the lack of solid career in the final years. And maybe fed his ego to meet a woman in a nightclub and take her home and sleep together. But I've never looked at it as dark because it was consensual. It's not like they were hiding cameras or anything. But police are thinking, right, there is a link here. There is a link between this porn life and his death, and we know it. So they track down John Carpenter, and they question him. And of course he denies knowing anything about it. So they investigate his home. They don't really find anything. And then they investigate his car. And they discover that his car is covered in blood. Everywhere. All over his car. So they're like, Well, well, well. Looky here, John Carpenter. And his explanation is that he had cut himself while in the car and that he just bled everywhere. And police are like, Okay, sure. Um, Show us the cut then. Show us where you cut yourself to produce that amount of blood. And John Carpenter can't produce the cut. So they're like, yeah, right, mate, this is not sounding good. So this is the most 1978 bit of the investigation that I love. In 2021, if crime scene investigators were looking you know, in a car for blood, they would, you know, take samples, put it in vials, go in a lab, etc. But no, what they do is they get this massive, massive piece of wood. Police get this huge, big piece of wood and they remove the car doors from John Carpenter's car 
and using gaffer tape, they tape the car doors to this big piece of wood. And then they store this as a piece of evidence. And then they do things like they rip out the car seat and they gaffer tape it to another big bit of wood. Not the most scientific, but hey, it's what they had to work with, right? It's it's what they had to do. It's just, it's a bit comedy when you watch any documentaries about this and they suddenly bring out this huge piece of wood with car doors taped to it. So the police are not giving up on John Carpenter, but there's just, there isn't really enough to hold him. The blood samples that come from the car, all that they can get is a blood type, and it's type B. And that is the same as Bob Crane, but does that really prove anything conclusively? I mean, we'd say yes, but it's a tricky business, you know? You're just going by blood type at this point, and that's it, really, in terms of anything like concrete evidence that they've got. I mean, it's all pointing to John Carpenter, but the difficulty is he's denying it, and there's not really evidence to support that he's guilty. And no other leads really appear. I mean, it's a good question to ask, do they try other leads? Well, they do, in a half arsed fashion. They kind of look at, could it have been revenge? Could one of the girls who was taped, could she have come back and done it? Could she have gotten a boyfriend to come and do it? Was it a crazed fan? Was there anyone in his family who wanted him dead? But none of this goes anywhere. And it's slipping through the fingers of police. And it will slip even further until it just doesn't exist. The case goes cold. John Carpenter is no longer questioned. And he goes on to live his life quite happily. The porn collection that the two men had created is given over to Bob Crane's son. Because that's not creepy. <laughs> he quite proudly advertises his dad's porn collection. <laughs> now, it's massive frustration for police because they, they're so sure that if they could just put John Carpenter in front of a jury, they would have him tried, but no judge will allow it. So throughout the 1980s, police keep trying on this case. And then the 90s come around. And early in the 90s, when it's still sitting as a cold case, it's gnawing away at police as this unsolved crime that they just know who it is, but they just need to be able to pin it on him. And in 1992, a judge is approached by police who agrees, OK, this judge says, fine, we'll reopen the case and we'll try John Carpenter. Not that they've got any more evidence, it's just that police have been on this now for so long that a judge finally goes, OK, let's put him in front of a jury. Of course, they're going to find him guilty and he will go to jail, but that's not how a jury sees it. In court, it's mainly circumstantial evidence. Sure, the two men had argued. Sure, they were friends and they had had this escapade together. They'd parted ways, but... Where was the real evidence of murder? So 1992 couldn't really do anything that 1978 couldn't do because the evidence had been so badly handled. Now in 1996, John Carpenter dies, age 70. He died from health complications and he went to his grave cleared of any involvement in the death. Did this stop police? Hell no, it did not. In 2016, it comes back around. The weak evidence that they've got is handed over to the same team who dealt with the Jean Benet Ramsey case and the OJ Simpson case. It was examined and it led nowhere. It was expensive. And it was a waste of time. By this point also, I might just point out, <coughs> Robert, the son, had made a porn website using his dad's footage from the 1970s 
and he feels there's nothing wrong with people wanting to see this and they did it was quite a popular site I don't think it exists anymore but it did for a while so when it's all packed away in 2016 it does raise the question how much can we keep looking back and trying to solve unsolvable cases I'll say that because I think this statement from a judge is really important. In 2016, a judge says, We simply cannot continue to fund the re-examination of cases where the evidence was poorly handled in the hope that more advanced technologies will offer us the answers. It is just a waste of money. Now this sparked a huge row, and quite rightly, from families and victims of crimes committed in the 70s, the 80s, the early 90s, who still want justice. I mean, I know that there have been amazing, incredible advances in rape testing kits. So, you know, p police are able now to track down rapists who thought they'd gotten away with it in the 70s and 80s and, and, you know, find the right justice for these people. I think that those judge, I think that the words that that judge offers do present an interesting idea about how much looking back we can do. And I know that there are diehard fans of cold cases, but there is also the argument that crime rates are higher now worldwide than they've ever been. So how much more time can we spend looking back when we should maybe be trying to look forward? I'm not suggesting for a second, of course I'm not, that we shelve cases from the past and say, okay, well, we're done with that, we don't have the evidence because it was 1978 and we didn't know how to process things. I just think it's interesting that the Bob Crane murder sparks such a big interest in that argument about looking back or looking forward. There will always be cases that we want solved because they were never done properly at the time or we have new advances in technology, of course. But this judge also points out a lot of money was spent in 2016 getting that team who looked at the Jean Bonnet and the O.J. Simpson cases. A lot of money was spent getting them to go over the evidence to try and prove that a dead man was guilty of this crime. Interesting. I'll leave you to think on it. So ends the story of Bob Crane. Okay, 1978 wasn't it great? I am so glad, so glad that this is the last one of these because honestly I have completed Google in the search for facts. I mean, think last week I gave some bloody fact about cereal, for God's sake. <laughs> the well is running dry. <laughs> anyway, 1978, New Zealander Naomi Jones, now Dame Naomi, if you don't mind, is the first woman to sail around the world single-handedly. Good on her. The world's first test tube baby is born. Louise Joy Brown is born in Manchester, England. And the best-selling book of the year is by J.R.R. Tolkien, a writer of Lord of the Rings, and that gubbins. And it's called, well, it's unpronounceable, The Similarity... Ah, something like that, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, if you're a fan of literature, you might know that book. Okay, here we are at the final story. You might remember that in one of the very early 1978 episodes, I think it was episode one, I mentioned something that Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher had said in 78. She said that Britons feared being swamped by people from a different culture. 
And I think I said at the time, thanks, we're still paying for that. And I meant it. I mean, in 1978, that was such a flammable statement. And it was the truth. There were divides between cultures and they were stark. They were really, really stark. And of course, one of those divides was racial. Now, if you were to go a walking in London today, you might happen upon a beautiful park called the Altab Ali Park. It's got an ornate arch at the entrance. It's one of these like urban parks. So it's concrete and there's there's a few trees, there's some benches and there's some gorgeous pieces of art. So what about this park? Why does it exist? Well, Altab Ali was born in Bangladesh and was a British citizen in 1978, living in East London. And at the time, East London was a place of unrest. As I said, racial divides were strong and Altab and his family, well, they had had their fair share of racist behaviour, as did the surrounding Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Chinese families. At the time, it was advised that moving in groups for safety was a good idea. Safety in numbers. Asian pregnant women were advised not to walk the streets alone in case of attack. Shops owned by Bangladeshis were robbed, Shopkeepers were beaten, local Indian, Pakistani delis and supermarkets, they were just targets for racism. So at the time, the National Front, which was a UK far-right white supremacist party, they were on the rise. And they were making noises about wanting to rid London of anyone not white. I will say, of course, this wasn't everyone in London. Uh, of course it wasn't. It's just that tensions were particularly high in the East End of London. So what of Altab Ali? Well, he was 25. 25 years old. He lived with his mum, his dad and his two brothers in the East End. Now, the family had been in London for about 15 years and so really had Altab. He'd, you know, he'd mainly grown up in the east of London, and it was his home. It was his family's home. But sadly, this racial prejudice, this was just a part of their daily lives. Now, he trained quite young Altab as a machinist um, of clothing, particularly. He knew his way around a sewing machine. And in London, he got a job as a teenager working on the markets just off of Brick Lane. Oh, the markets in London. Brilliant. I just love them. I love them so much. Anyway, here's 25-year-old Altab. And he's, you know, he's down the market giving it two for a pound, four for a tenner. Yeah, all that jazz. <laughs> and he's making a living out of this. Now, he goes home one evening and his family tells him they found him a bride. Great. Thanks, Altab. He discovers that his bride is in Bangladesh. No worries. I mean, this was fairly common practices for young men to go back to Bangladesh, meet the woman who would become their wife, and then return to the UK and live as a married couple. So you would go there, you would get married, and then you would come back and live and set up your life in the UK. Fine. So he goes to Bangladesh, he meets her, he's there for five months, and they get married. Now he comes back to London and his bride will arrive shortly after him. Except she won't. On May the 4th, 1978, Altab pops out of the house to collect a few things for dinner. He's making a meal for his family. And he's walking close to home, back home, he's got his shopping, and he's walking past a garden called St Mary's. 
when three teenagers appear out of the shadows. Altab tries to get past them and they block his path. They begin to use racial slurs and to push him around. Again, he tries to move away, but he can't, he's surrounded. The teenagers start throwing punches. And Altab does his best to fight back, but he can't stand up to them. The fight ends when the teenagers stab Altab in the neck. He collapses and they kick his dying body until his lungs are punctured and there's no life left in him. And then they run. At the same time that this attack is happening on a busy street in East London, there's an election going on down the road. The National Front are trying to gain votes. They want power, they want control of England. When his body is found, it shakes the community. Now, as I said, there have been horrible racist events, but nothing so brutal as this. And this is why really I want to tell this story, is because that tension that's there, it explodes in this moment. Altab's murder sparks a huge reaction from the Indian community in East London. They are angry. They're tired of this. And they're asking, is this what's become of young men in their 20s? Like they can't go out to buy something for their dinner without dying alone in the street. So you can imagine anger fills the area. And one week after his death, 7,000 people march from the spot where he was found dead at St Mary's Park all the way to Westminster to demand change, to demand that the government help protect minorities. His death is huge public news. It's on every TV station and newspaper. The white supremacists, they come out in their hundreds and they go on the rampage. Indian shops, Pakistani stores, they're set on fire. Racist graffiti starts appearing all over the East End of London. And the marches for Altab just get bigger. So as the actions of the white supremacists get bigger, so do the marches. From 7,000 people a week after his death, it increases to 10,000, then 15,000. Eventually 25,000 people, not just from London, but all across the UK, are marching and they're waving huge banners and posters with Altab's face on it. And they're chanting, Who killed Altab Ali? Racism, racism. And this will carry on through 1978, but not before the lives of many young Bangladeshi men are taken as revenge for the rising up of these communities. Observer newspaper publishes this headline two weeks after his death. Any Asian careless enough to be walking the streets alone at night is a fool. Ooh. And what his death did was it brought to the surface and made really visible the ugly problem. You know, in that same year, letters written in blood would be sent to Asian shopkeepers saying, you're next. But did that, did that keep the Asian communities down? No. They continued to march and they continued to protest. And what's kind of amazing is these communities came together. Suddenly the Jewish community in London who had up to that point perhaps kept themselves separate from everything else, they were joining together. Anyone who felt like they were a minority were pulling together to try and force change, basically. Arrests started and they became more and more frequent. 
And a year after the murder, the local council ordered that every 4th of May be a day of peace in the East End and that the area where he was killed would become a place for communal grieving. Now, I said that Altab died next to St Mary's Park and that park had its name changed. It became the Altab Ali Park. Bangladeshi artists were commissioned to make the art that would stand in place to remember the attack. Over time, there were less and less protests, fewer marches. But I think it's so interesting that in 1978, there wasn't, you know, slogans that we all now know and attach to and use. But it was still about that one victim being the face of a movement. And what a movement he was. Every year there's a long procession, even now, from the park through London to remember him. And films have been made about his death. Over time, the the National Front lost its hold on Britain. And things began to change. The 80s was knocking at the door and change was coming. Different attitudes would be born. I'm not saying it changed overnight. I'm not saying it's gone away. It's not. Of course it didn't. But somewhere in history, there's a bigger conversation to have about cultures and lives and respect. And in 1978 in London, that one guy, Altab Ali, has such a major part to play in that. And so ends the story. All right then. Well, that's it. 1978 is cancelled. It's over. It's done. (laughs) All right, we've talked the Burger Chef murders, John Wayne Gacy, pregnancy tablets, racial attacks, Ted Bundy, missing aeroplanes, the Scarsdale diet, Studio 54, Jonestown, the Pope, and a weird creature that stopped men dying in a mine. It's been busy. I hope you've enjoyed it. Okay. Goodbye. Good evening, and just as the Roman Catholic Church thought it had found a warm and compassionate successor to the late Pope Paul, it now finds it must search anew. Pope John Paul I is dead, his reign lasting just 33 days, the shortest in more than three centuries. Jerry Bowen reports from Vatican City. The body of Pope John Paul I lay in state today in the Clementine Hall of the Papal Apartments, not far from the bedroom where he died of a heart attack last night. Well, Terry, I reported over a week ago that Bundy was a suspect in the disorder. Now, Lord, authorities can, can continue to concentrate. What are my feelings? I'd like to see them, you know, do something to him besides put him in a, you know, institution. I'd like to see him be, well, killed if I get my feelings to say. Prosecutor Robert Egan named Mrs. Wood's son along with all of Gacy's other victims as he opened for the state. Egan described Gacy as rational, premeditated, and evil, who killed his victims like flies when they got in his way. Carefully planned murders that resulted in passionate successor to the late Pope Paul. It now finds it must search anew. For Pope John Paul I is dead. His reign lasting just 33 days, the shortest in more than three centuries. Jerry Bowen reports from Vatican City. I'll plead not guilty right now. All right, all right. Before you start asking me, because I know you will, I know what you want. Let me just do this. Right, we're going to do a bit of what I'm going to call Barry (laughs) O'Kay. Sing along. <laughs> Come on, I want to hear you in in, in full voice. <clears throat> I'll hit the track and we can we can let me just get the lyrics up, right? Here we go. Woo! Yeah. Ready, everyone? 
Listen to the ground. There is movements all around. There is something going down. That's about high for me. <laughs> Can feel it on the waves of the air. There is dancing. Out. Oh my gosh, I like a Simpsons character. There is something we can share. That sweet, sweetie woman, she moved through the light. I was too low, controlling my mind and my soul. When you reach out for me, yeah, and the feeling is right. Here we go, night fever, night fever. We know how to do it. I don't know if I'm at the right bit of the song. <clears throat> well, let's just carry on. Everyone, here we go. Night fever, night fever. We know how to do it. Here I am, praying for this moment to last. Living on the music so fine, born on the wine, making it mine. Here we go. Night fever, night fever, we know how to do it. Oh, you sound gorgeous, everyone. Night fever, night fever, uh, we know how to show it. And I think that's enough. Oh, you can keep singing if you want to, but um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't want to um, waste any more of my beautiful singing voice. You all know the words to this one, I know you do. Right, I'll be Danny, you be Sandy, right? I got chills, they're multiplying And I'm losing control Cause the power you're supplying It's electrifying Right, go! Mm. You better shape up. I'll just keep me up there. Nothing left for me to do. You're the one that I want. You are the one I want. Ooh, 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 honey. The one that I want. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, I'm the one that I want. Oh, I think I've lost that. Ooh, the one that I want. You are the one I want. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, I bet we sounded amazing. <laughs> okay, um, you know this one, you know you love it. Oh, yeah. Get that funky disco beat. Oh yeah, here we go. Her name was Lola. She was a showgirl with yellow feathers in her hair and her dress got down to there. She would merangue and do the cha-cha. And well, she tried to be a star. Tony always tend to bar across the crowded floor. They worked from eight till four. They were young and they had each other, who could ask for more? At the Copa, Copa Cabana, the hottest spot north of Havana. Here at the Copa, Copa Cabana, music and passion are always in fashion at the Copa. They fell in love. Oh yeah, that's funky, I love it. <laughs> Kiss mine is not the first heartbroken My eyes are not the first to cry Not first to know It's just no getting over you Just a fool who's willing to sit around and wait for you. But 
baby, can't you see? There's nothing left for me to do. Hopelessly devoted to you. But now there's nowhere to hide. Since you pushed my love aside, I'm out of my head. Hopelessly devoted to you. Hopelessly devoted to you. Hopelessly devoted to you.